I'm going to do Genesis. I'm going to try to do Genesis 20, 21, and 22. Because these things come of a piece. If you remember the last thing that we talked about in the life of Abraham, the man that God chose to create a whole new nation out of so that he might save the world, to bring the seed of the woman through. Therefore, this man's life is very, very unusual. The nation that God created through him is very, very unusual. It's born of a miracle. For he called a man in his, his old age, and he'd never had a child, neither had his, his wife. And God said, I'll make a great nation of you. And furthermore, I'll bring someone through your loins that will bless every family on the face of the earth. And we know who that someone is, right? Jesus Christ is the true seed of Abraham. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. Israel's a miracle. To be a Christian's a miracle. And the love of God is a miracle, right? Considering us, okay? So now, there's three incidents that we look at. The one in 20, the one in 21, and the big, big one in 22. Let me talk about what happened in 20. This is after... Uh, God told Abram, within a year, you're going to have a child. It's not going to be Ishmael. It's going to be the one that comes through your loins and through Sarah's loins. And also, this is right after Sodom and Gomorrah and the destruction of the cities of the plain and the deliverance of Lot. Verse tw uh, chapter 20, verse 1. Abram journeyed from there toward the south country and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur and sojourned in Gerar. Okay, so this would be the the south, uh, west, uh, southwest corner of the Mediterranean Sea area, what we call today the Gaza, the Gaza, the Gaza Strip. And that is a place that had been inhabited by the Philistines. And by the time of Abram, the Philistines were already there. The Philistines' leaders had titles. Abimelech is very similar to like Pharaoh or to... Caesar, okay? Abimelech. And Abimelech is king of the Philistines at that time. Abimelech means my father is king. Okay. Uh, it says, verse 2, Abram said of Sarah, his wife, she's my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. They come through, passing through, he makes the same error that he did earlier. He lied because he was afraid about his wife. He said, she's his sister. That really is a lie, even though you could justify it. But, you know, it's a lie. He's, see, that's his wife. Okay. So the king took her. It's just like that. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, you're a dead man. For the woman which you've taken, she's a man's wife. Abimelech, you're dead. Whoa. But Abimelech had not come near her. He hadn't touched her. And he said, Lord, will you also slay a righteous nation? And then he said, said he not unto me, she's my sister. And she, even she herself said, he's my brother. In the integrity of my heart and in its of my hands have I done this. I didn't mean to do this. I didn't take someone's wife on purpose. And God said to him in a dream, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart. Notice this is a, a conversation between God and a pagan in a dream. I know what's in your heart. Yeah, praise the Lord. That's right. I also withheld you from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I not to touch you. I wouldn't let you touch her. Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he's a prophet. And he will pray for you, and you will live. And if you restore her not, know that you will surely die, you and all that are yours. Do not touch this woman. You'll die, and everyone in your house will die. This man's a prophet. Now, I told you at the beginning of this series that one of the ways to understand it is that the Satan always wants to attack the seed of the woman. Satan wants to take the chosen people and say, you know what, that baby was not a miracle. That was... Pharaoh's baby, or that was Abimelech's baby. That wasn't really a miracle of God at all. Satan is still attacking the seed that was going to come through Abram. So God said, don't touch him. Don't touch her. Don't hurt him. Give him a gift. Ask him to pray for you. And so, therefore, Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all his servants and told all these things in their ears. And the men were sore afraid. 
Then Abimelech called Abram and said unto him, What have you done to us? And what have I offended thee that you brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? You've done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. Abimelech's rebuking Abram. And he's right. <laughs> Why did you do that? You almost got me killed. By the way, this is what the, pro- the scripture often quoted, quoted in the Psalms says, Touch not my anointed do my prophets no harm. It's talking about this story right here. He said to pagan kings, touch not my anointed, do my prophets no harm. He said, why did you do this to me? What did you see that you did this thing? Verse 10. And Abram said, because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place and they will slay me for my wife's sake. And yet she is indeed my sister. She's the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. That's what I call a lame excuse, okay? That is lame and weak, and the pagan king is actually right as he rebukes Abram. Now, the reason I bring this part out is that Peter actually makes a reference to this in 1 Peter 3, and I won't have you turn there, but between 1 and 8, he says to wives that even if your husband is disobedient to the word, which every once in a great while might happen, okay? Don't be afraid. Commit it to God like the old holy women of old. Okay, basically, Sarah is given away to a pagan king, and her husband doesn't say a word. Talk about cowardice. But she trusted God, is what Peter said. She didn't rebuke her husband. Who did? God did, and God did a better job rebuking her husband than she ever could have done. God spoke through a pagan king and sternly rebuked Abram. Verse 13, it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house that I said unto her, this is my cut. Let's see, am I in the right chat, right? Yeah. Okay, Yeah. Verse 11, I'm sorry, I skipped 11. Abram said, because I thought, surely the fear of God is not in this place. They'll slay me for my wife's sake. And yet indeed she is my sister. Verse 13, it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house that I said unto her, this is my, thy kindness which you will show unto me. Every place we shall come, save me, he's my brother. So that's Abram's dishonest policy. All right, it's already got him near trouble before. And now it gets him in trouble again. You won't see this again until Isaac does the same thing with an Abimelech. All right. Anyway, and Abimelech took sheep and oxen and men servants and maid servants, women servants, and gave them unto Abram and restored him Sarah, his wife. And Abimelech said, behold, my land is before thee. Dwell where it pleases you. And unto Sarah, he said, behold, I've given thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, He is to thee a covering of the eyes unto all that are with thee, and with all other, thus she was reproved. Okay, I want to really clear up this very hard to understand verse right here. What he's saying is, I have given to you for thy brother, which by calling Abram her brother, he's still rebuking Abram, your brother, (laughs) a gift, a thousand pieces of silver, as a covering to your eyes. What does that mean? It does not mean a veil. It means it's a, it's a gift, a kind of propitiation to restore her honor. So when it says she's reproved, no, that, that's not what the text says. She wasn't reproved. She was vindicated. In other words, this woman is not a harlot. This woman, this is something that was done to her by her cowardly husband. I am here publicly justifying her. It's all a mistake. She's not an immoral woman, which is a shame-based culture. It's very important to get that straight. And so he vindicated Sarah, his wife, and let everyone know he never touched her. But the effect is, Abraham and his wife go into a pagan land, they get into some kind of oppression or captivity. And then on the way, the, the people that put them in some kind of captivity are, are threatened by God with death. And a kind of a plague comes on them because every woman in that king's kingdom, was uh, their womb was shut. And then 
they give, the Gentiles give Abraham and his wife riches and send them on their way. Abraham's a prophet. Everything is a prophecy of what was going to happen, in this case, 430 years later in Egypt. He's a prophet, and this is a prophecy. So Abram prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants, and they bare children. For the Lord had fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abram's wife. See, the plague came. Now, next episode. And the Lord visited Sarah, as he had said. And the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. I like this. The Lord did what he said. He visited her as he spoke. For Sarah conceived and bare Abram a son in his old age, Abraham and Sarah, at the set time of which God had spoken to them. So within a year of the last time, he said, within one year you'll have a child. She had a child. She actually had a child in her, in her 90s. <laughs> Okay. She didn't need to have her Egyptian maidservant sit on her lap and bear a child through her legs, as she already thought she, that's what she thought was the answer before. She literally conceived, had a child, and it goes on to say that she would nurse the child. Beautiful. Abram called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him. Isaac. How important is Isaac? Isaac was named before he was born. Isaac was predicted. He's like Christ. Isaac's name is incorporated into the name of God. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Isaac is no small figure. I don't know why he doesn't get appreciated. He's huge. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Isaac's a miracle baby. And he's chosen. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. That's fantastic. hundred-year-old man. It's the joy of a son. Oh, but he already has a son. That son that he already has is 14 years old, and in 14 years, a man can bond with his son, can't he, or his daughter, quite deeply. He already has a son, but he gets this miracle son, this blessing son, all right? The one son is a spiritual son, and the other son is a physical son, and the spiritual son comes after the physical. The physical has been there 14 years, and he is bonded to him. In fact, even that son is in covenant with the house because he was circumcised the same day Abram was. He already has a son, but he gets the son, the miracle son. The promise of God is fulfilled. And Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh so that all who hear will laugh with me. Remember the name, Isaac, laughter. And she said, who would have said unto Abram that Sarah would have given children suck? For I've borne him a son in his old age. Eighty years, the woman looks around and sees what everywhere you turn, nursing mothers. And aches to be one but had long since given up on it until God came into her life and made a promise. And even in the face of the promise, she laughed when he actually said it was going to happen. But now God gets the laugh, laugh, the last laugh. I guess that's one of the meanings of the name Isaac. And the child grew. Now, the only thing that's important to the Holy Spirit for us is from the time the child's born until his weaning party his weaning party. You throw a party when a child is weaned. I think I can see why. <laughs> Who knows how old he is? But it must be of tender age. Maybe two or at the most three. It's time for his weaning party. It's a big event. The child grew and was weaned, and Abram made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. Now, this is the most important book in the world. Well, actually, there's 66 of them, but this is the foundational book. 
This is the beginning. What is the significance of a weaning party? This is Abraham and Isaac. And here's the significance. Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had born unto Abram, mocking. He's mocking. Let me stop and talk about this. You see, we, we focus on a family, don't we? And it, and it began last week. An irritation comes into the family. A born of frustration. How is this promise going to be fulfilled? We, we're in our 80s. They haven't had a child. And Sarah has a good idea. Great idea, really. Practical idea. Only problem is it's a human idea. It's not a God idea. Okay, it's legal. Go into the, the Egyptian maid and bear a child through him. And she could sit on my lap. And according to the laws of the land, that child's hers. Because Hagar's her property. Great idea. Problem is, it's not blessed by God. The, the Egyptian is, gets pregnant right away. And that instantly causes irritation. Ever so slight an irritation. The irritation grows through combinations of things. The woman who's pregnant, the young woman, in a culture where pregnancy is everything. If you don't have a baby and you're a woman, what in the world? God has not blessed you. You are, you're deserted. What in the world's wrong with you? And this woman is elevated and she begins to... Uh, pride herself over Hagar, over Sarah, her mistress. And she begins to mince around and she begins to make comments and she's making uh, Sarah mi miserable. Miserable. And Sarah, who has rights as a wife, a lot of people don't understand this about the Bible and everything. There's different levels of wives. There's concubines, and then there's your light wife, and there's your legal wife, and she's the top level, and she's claiming her rights. Abram, do something about her. She's making me miserable. She's priding herself. She's boasting in my face. Abram says, treat her whichever way you want. Once again, this is the most important book in the world, and this is the basic book, the, fundamental, the foundational book of the most important book in the world. Why do we have to go through the drama of something like a soap opera? Because this irritation that came about because someone had a good idea instead of following God, that just started between two women, and worked its way in to irritate the family. This irritation has now grown massive worldwide. The hatred. <laughs> it's forcing people all over the world to take sides. And some of the sides they take are just, they don't even make sense. Like the woman's march in the name of woman's lib. Does Islam say woman's lib to you? And yet, the organizer of the Women's March is a Syrian Sharia promoter. The women put on the head, hijabs and shouted Allah Akbar, a religion that forces women into the most degrading subjugation that you can even conceive of. I can't even think of another religion that would degrade women worse as Islam, and yet our liberated, modern, pampered, uh, Western women falling right in lockstep with Islam. Why? See, here's what I want to point out. It's this irritation that grows and 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 engulfs the whole world to the point where neutrality is impossible, where people get polarized, where you get sucked into one side or the other. It even goes against reason. It's because it's an irritation 
about something so much more important than even the people that were irritated at the time ever realize. Two babies, 14 years apart, one through whom would come the seed of the woman who would save the whole world. The other was a good idea and a counterfeit and would present another salvation, which would involve everyone in the world too. If one would bless everyone in the world, believe me, the other's going to bring a curse on everyone in the world. There is no curse as retrograde as Islam. And the reason I bring up Islam is because Islam has become the custodian of this irritation. The one standing up on the behalf of the aggrieved party. Now, we come to this weaning party, and it should be one of the happiest days of Sarah's life. Only she sees something happening between the two half-brothers that troubled her so deeply. See, I don't think the King James gives a good translation of what this word is. His brother was teasing him. Would you throw a kid out of your house for teasing his brother? If so, I don't think we'd have kids. <laughs> what do you got to do to get be, be considered so toxic that you got to send a kid out of your house? What's actually going on there? Look at verse 9. It, the children grew and the child grew and was weaned, and Abram made a great feast the same day when Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, which she bore unto Abram, mocking. Well, some translations say making sport. Some say teasing. Some say mocking. But here's the thing. It's a Hebrew word, metzahek which literally has sexual undertones. Okay, look, what am I saying? Well, it's the same word used in Genesis 26. Go to Genesis 26. The same word. It's, I'm the big dog here, and I'm going to put you in your place. It's a sexual humiliation. We don't need to go. I, I wouldn't know what the exact details are. I don't care. All, God just used the word. 26. Okay, the same thing is happening. This is Isaac in the future. He's going through a land and another Abimelech. And, Abim and he lies about his wife. Only this time Abimelech looked out the window and saw Isaac uh, in verse 8. It came to pass when he'd been there a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out a window and saw, behold, Isaac, he was sporting with Rebekah, his wife. He saw that the way Isaac treated his wife was a way that you wouldn't do it unless you were intimate. It was something of intimacy. Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, of a surety, she's your wife. Why did you say she's my sister? And Isaac once again said, because I said, I don't want to die for her. <laughs> like father, like son. You know what's good news, though? Abram got so weak in that area that he lied about his wife twice. Isaac lied about his wife once. But you go down two generations, and Joseph went to prison for 13 years. Rather than break his integrity and compromise with a woman that actually wanted to seduce him. So how many know family sins can eventually get worked out? Okay, now, this is what happens. This is the irritation, and this is where the irritation gets intense. Now, that's what the book of Genesis will teach. It just tracks this irritation. And the next generation, it gets even worse. Now we're not talking stepbrothers, twins. It says in verse 10, Wherefore she said to Abram, cast out this bondwoman and her son. For the son of this bondwoman is not going to be the heir with my son, even Isaac. Throw her and him out of the house. Now he'd be about 17. 
at the most. She was 14 when Isaac Salt was born. It's the weaning party. He'd be 17 years old. A 17-year-old boy doing something appropriate with a three-year-old boy, his half-brother. Like I say, he's not pulling his hair or teasing him that got him kicked out of the house. She saw something that just stopped her short and said, get out. Now, Abram does not want to do this. This is pain. This is very deep pain because even if you got a real bad boy, the last thing you want to do is throw him out of the house. And Sarah said, cast him out. And once again, people might think she's being arrogant with her husband. No, she had rights as a wife. Okay. Cast out the bondman, which means the servant. And Abram, it says, uh, God said, that verse 11, the thing was very grievous in Abram's sight because of his son. Well, it would. I think it would be like cutting off an arm. And God said to Abram, don't let it be grievous in your sight because of the lad and because of the bondwoman. In all that Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. See, he shouldn't have listened to her the first time. But now God's saying, now you do got to listen to her. Get him out of here. See, what is this? This too is an attack on the seed of the woman. Sexual humiliation. Mess with your mind. Set something in a family that'll go generation after generation until it destroys it. Get them out. Get them out. Okay. Half the reason the immigrants are doing what they're doing in Germany, which I won't go into detail. Yes, it is sexual, but it's also religious. It's deliberate humiliation and desecration. Remember they did it in front of the Cologne church? Even though the church is empty, probably a skeletal remain of what used to be. But in the Muslim mindset, they did it because it was a church. They did it to desecrate. Ishmael did it because in Isaac shall thy seed be called. An attack on the seed. Abram put him out. And then he said, also of the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation. You know why? Because he's your seed. You know how mighty the Arab nation is? The Arab nation is one of the great nations of the world. It's totally unique to the other nations of the world. You know how many Arab states there are in, in uh, the UN? Like 27. And Arab dominated states, 57. The Arabs are rich unbelievably rich. And why? What do they create? <laughs> they're blessed. They're ungrateful, but they're blessed. <laughs> they're miserable, but they're blessed. Oh, but let's never forget, a good many of the sons of Ishmael actually became Christians before the Muslims uh, practiced jihad uh, and to the point of genocide on most of the Arab world. Remember, before Muhammad came, most of the Arab world was Christian. It was Christian cults, it was Christian heresies, it was Christian variations. But Ishmael just embraced the cross until, for the most part, until uh, Muhammad came along. And fired up that old, what it's, what it's called in the book of Ezekiel 35, the everlasting hatred. The resentment of Hagar, the resentment of Ishmael, the resentment of Esau. He, 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 Islam codifies it. It keeps it going and stokes it up. So it says there that, um, that uh, Abram had to do something hard. Abram had to do something so hard. He had to put his son out. Where, are you, where is out when you're wandering around in southern Israel? Out is the harshest desert you've ever seen. Okay. So 
He says in verse 14, And Abram rose up early in the morning. By the way, this is well remembered by one out of seven people in the world. The older son was supposed to get the inheritance. Look at, look the evil Jews. Look what they do. They put him out. Abram rose up early in the morning, took bread and a bottle of water, gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and the child, and sent her away. <laughs> they didn't have a donkey or a camel to give her? Nope. Here, take this water and bread, put it on your shoulder. May God keep you. I think Abram probably died a thousand deaths that day. And they departed into the wilderness of Beersheba, which still exists there. And the water was spent in the bottle, and she cast this child under one of the shrubs. Well, don't think child, little, I mean, he's 18 years old, but she basically said, you lay down here, I'm going to lay down there, because I don't want to see you die. And she went and sat over against him a good way off, as it were a bow shot, for she said, let me not see the death of the child. And she sat over against him, and she lifted up her voice, and she wept. And God heard the voice of the lad, and the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said to her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him in thy hand, for I will make him a great nation. God loves Ishmael. One of the reasons God loves Ishmael is just because God loves Abraham. And he's Abram's son. For good or bad, God loves him. Ishmael, in the end, many of the Ishmaelites will be saved. The day will come, he says, where Egypt, which is the largest Arab country in the world, I'll call Egypt my, my, my servant and uh, what we call Iraq, but Syria will be my, my, my friend, and they and Israel, they'll all stand together before me. They're going to get rid of Islam one day, the heavy burden. Okay. He says, God is going to make him a great nation. Okay, let's see, what verse was I on? I'm sorry, I lost my place. 19, and God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water and she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad to drink. And God was with the lad and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. Remember the original prophecy, he's going to be a wild ass of a man. He'll live out in the desert. No one will tame him. Not even he, won't, he won't even be able to get along with his brother. His hand will be against everyone. And God made him an archer. And he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. And it came to pass at that time that Abimelech and Phicol, the chief captain of the host, spake unto Abram, saying, God is with you in all that you do. Now therefore swear unto us, Hereby, God, that you will not deal falsely with me, nor with my son, nor with my son's son, but according to the kindness that I've done unto thee, you shall do to me and to the land wherein you have sojourned. And Abram said, I will swear. So he makes a peace, a peace pact with the pagans that lived in the Holy Land. And let me skip down to 22. And by the way, it... She says, uh, Hagar says of God, you are the God who really sees. You are the God who really sees, Jehovah Jireh. Because he saw her in the wilderness. He saw Ishmael dying in the wilderness. And right out there in the middle of nowhere, he, gave, he showed him water and he gave him life. So you are the God who sees. That's a beautiful name. Okay, now, 22, it came to pass after all these things. Now, let me stop and talk about a few things. All what things, okay? Basically, what Abram's life is, if you really think about it, since God called him, as many things happen, the only things that count are in the, in the text. But one way to look at it is, is a series of separations. See, Abram was a flat-out pagan. He wasn't a Jew. He wasn't a Hebrew until God revealed himself. He was in what we call Iraq. And everything is a separation. Number one separation, come out of your country and your nation. So you gotta leave everything that's familiar and comfortable. Now that's hard, right? But he believed, okay? 
And then leave your kindred, okay? He had to leave his father. He had to leave his relatives, his unbelieving family, okay? And then there came that point where he was in Egypt, but he had to leave Egypt. Egypt is the, is the life and the love and the pleasures of this world. Abram had to leave. So he's always having a separation. And then he was separated from his nephew, Lot. And what is Lot a type of? He's a type of the carnal ones they come along for the ride. They don't really believe. Sooner or later, we're going to be separated from every lot. Okay. And then he had to be separated from Ishmael, which Ishmael's not portrayed as a rogue in Scripture. It's complicated. He did a bad thing. But he's not portrayed as a rogue. And to this point, that was probably the most painful separation that he could have. But this is what it took to create a brand new nation out of this one man. A series of separations from everything worldly. Ishmael is the good idea, the product of the flesh. He came from Sarah's mind and from Abram's loins, but he didn't come from God, although God blessed him. Could there be anything more that God would require him to separate himself from? Well, that's the meaning of chapter 22. I'll just keep you a few more minutes. Came to pass after those things, after those separations, that God did tempt Abram and said unto him, Abram, and he said, Behold, here I am. He said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell you of. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Now, you told me to leave my land, I did it. You told me to leave my family, I did it. You told me to leave Egypt, I did it. I actually separated from Lot. I actually sent my son, my first son, out into the wilderness, teenager, because you showed me. In Isaac shall thy seed be called. You gotta let go of things if you want Christ, right? But this, are you kidding me? And the way God said, take your only son. Well, Isaac, Ishmael was his son, but no, not in the way God's talking. Take your only son. Whom you love, he says. Get thee unto the land of Moriah. There's a mountain range where Jerusalem is now. It's it's Moriah. It includes a place called Moriah, a place called Zion, a place we know of as Calvary. (laughs) He's got to go there. He doesn't know what's going to happen on Calvary. He says... Take now the son, thine only son Isaac, whom you love, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I'll tell you of. Remember everywhere Abram went, he put up an altar. So you take, build a stone altar. Okay, now what? Now put your son on it. And slaughter him there. Burn him. Offer everything of him to me. And Abram rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him. And Isaac, his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went into the place which God had told him. This is kind of neat, you know, Isaac and two others. What do you have on on Calvary? Jesus and two others. Then on the third day, Abram lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abram said unto his young men, You stay here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and we'll come again to you. No, no, it's the faith of Abram. We are going to go up there and worship, and we are going to come back to you. And Abram took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, And they went, both of them, together. So once again, Isaac's climbing a hill with wood on his back, the wood of his own sacrifice. The cross, 
This is, a par- this is a prophecy. And Isaac spake unto Abram his brother and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And, I, and he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abram said, My son, now look at this wording. God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Remember, Abram's a prophet. You notice that wording? God will provide himself a lamb. John the Baptist one day would look at Jesus and say, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And what is Jesus? Jesus is the offering God made to himself, of himself. So, it says, God will provide himself. In verse 9, And they came to the place which God told him of, and Abram built an altar there, and he laid the wood in order, and he bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. The binding of Isaac, this is called the Akira, the, 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 the binding of Isaac. Now, how, he's a, Isaac's a full-grown man now. You think that he had to wrestle him down to bind him? No, Isaac went like this. Okay, Father, whatever. Real faith. Like I say, God put Isaac's name in his own name. Isaac, a great, tremendous type of Christ here. Here, son, put your hands out. Let me bind them on your feet. Now, let me help you up here on this stone altar, and I'll arrange the wood. We'll start the fire. And It says, uh, uh, Isaac, uh, Isaac, you know, here am I, Father, here am I. It says, They came to, oh, verse 11, the, uh, the Abram stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Why? Yeah, obedience to God. Obedience to God. Complete obedience, unquestioning obedience. Now, the book of Hebrews, I won't have you turn there, but the book of Hebrews refers to this and says, Abram did it by faith, even though he knew that the promise would come through that son. In Isaac shall thy seed be called. Well, how can I kill my son? The promise come through it. Then it says, well, Abram figured, well, if God had to, he'd raise him from the dead. What did Abram believe in? A son who gives his life as a sacrifice to God and then is raised from the dead. Abram believed in the son that gives his life as a sacrifice to God is raised from the dead. He gets his knife just up like that, and then just at the right time, the Lord stops him. He stretched forth his hand, took the knife to slay his son, and the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abram, Abram, and he said, Here am I. He said, Don't lay your hand on thy lad, neither do thou anything unto him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Now, here's another thing, okay. Abram's not just anybody. Abram is the one man on earth at that time in total covenant with God. That means, the covenant means whatever I have is yours, and equally so, what you have is mine. I give you my son, and he did. That son may as well have died. Okay, to him, he did die. I don't think the relationship could ever be the same. I give you my son. God says, great, I see it. You won't hold anything back from me. We are in covenant. I'll give you and your seed, my son. And then it goes on, and then I'll close. Um, thank you for your patience. He says, um, he says, lay not your hand, verse 12, on the lad. Neither do thou anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you haven't withheld thy son, your only son from me. And Abram lifted up his eyes and behold, and, and, and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. Thicket is thorns. Okay, so instead of Abram's son, a substitute is presented there. It's a male lamb caught in a thorny thicket by his horns, which means... There's thorns around his head. Okay. See, this is thousands of years. 
before Jesus came to this very mountain and laid his life on this very mountain, Mount Moriah, Mount Calvary, Mount Sinai, it's all the same range. So he sees the ram and he sees the thorns and the horns and he went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering instead of his son, a substitute. Christ died for sins once and for all, the just for the unjust, to bring us to God. And Abram called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. God sees. He called it the same thing that uh, Hagar called God, the Lord who sees. Abram says, in the mount of the Lord, it's a prophecy. In this mountain, it shall be seen. It shall be seen. The salvation of the world. The seed of the woman. The one person that would come through Abram to bless every family on the face of the earth. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abram out of the heaven the second time. He said, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord. For because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, in blessing I'll bless you, in multiplying I'll multiply you. Your seed is the stars of the heavens and is the sand which is on the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed because you obeyed my voice. So Abram returned unto his young men, and they rose up and went together to Beersheba, and Abram dwelt at Beersheba. And it came to pass after these things, that it was told Abram, saying, Behold, Milcah, she hath born children unto thy brother Nahor, and Huz, his firstborn, and Buzz, his brother, and Camuel, the father of Abram, and Kassid, and Hazoth, and Pildash, and Jifla, and Bethuel, and Bethuel beget Rebekah. These eight Milcah did bear to Nahor, Abram's brother, and his concubine, whose name was Reuma, she bare also Teba, Gaham, the Hash, and Makab. Someone said, what's that got to do with anything? That Rebecca, she's going to be in the line too. She's going to be in the line too. See, look, there's an amazing blessing that is going to come through Abram. But there's an amazing warfare against it. There's an irritation that starts in the house of the man who God would remake the human race and start all over again, bring a new race and bring a salvation to the world. And yet an irritation comes that's so deep, so irritating, it doesn't even stay in the house. It doesn't even stay in the time. It goes on after on, century after century, right up to our present day. What's it all about? Well, they couldn't stop the seed from coming. What they want to do is stop people from ever believing. They want to bring people into a different allegiance entirely. What you're seeing on the streets today, believe me, is directly connected to the story. Thank you, Father God, in Jesus' name. What a book. We stand here and open it up. It's like we're getting up to a high tree and looking farther than anybody else. And seeing clearer than everybody else. In those brief moments when the Holy Spirit takes us through this book and shows us things to come and shows us the spiritual reality of what is. Father, I pray for the children of Ishmael and for the Muslims that they will keep on being saved. From, you have shown yourself to many. You wanted to save and, 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 and bless every family on the face of the earth. Father, I pray, O oh Lord God, for our generation, which is taking sides already in this conflict. They don't even know it. They don't even know what the issues are, but they're being sucked into the sides because ultimately, Lord, this is a spiritual battle not even between Isaac and Ishmael or Jacob and Esau, but between Christ and Satan, oh God. Clear away the mist. Let us see as clear as day. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all.